Recommendations Committee, and I will be facilitating this webinar. This is Tammy. Bear with us one quick moment. We're here. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, on behalf of Michelle Spencer, the Director of the Prevention and Health Promotion Administration at the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we welcome you to the Breastfeeding Training Resources webinar. This webinar was organized as a result of the Maryland Hospital Breastfeeding Policy Recommendation Survey, which many of you completed in July of this year. The results of this survey showed an overwhelming request for breastfeeding training resource materials. Thank you for joining this webinar and for your commitment to our statewide quality improvement initiative to increase support by giving what, what we're giving to breastfeeding moms and babies. Enjoy the webinar. This webinar will consist of four panel members from Maryland Birthing Hospitals who will be sharing their experiences and breastfeeding training resources to improve maternity care and support breastfeeding moms. This webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent out to all attendees. A link to this webinar will also be posted on the DHMH Maryland Hospital Breastfeeding Policy Recommendations webpage. A training resource list will also be shared. This list will be emailed to participants of this webinar and will also be posted on the DHMH website. All participants are muted on this webinar. The question chat box is the only way to ask questions. This box is located in the upper right corner of your screen. If your question chat box is not expanded, click on the orange arrow to expand. To ask a question, Type in the white box as shown on this screen and push send. Please use the question chat box for questions throughout the webinar. We will address as many questions as possible, time permitting. Our first panelist is Betty Ellis from Calvert Memorial Hospital. Betty, you, will, you now have the webinar. I do not see the PowerPoint. I don't either. This is Pam. Okay, Tammy's going to be coming in. It was up earlier and then it went off. Are you guys getting anything? Now Got it's it. up, no. yes. Okay. We'll have one side back. Okay. We apologize for the technical difficulties. <clears throat> Well, we will get started with our first panelist, uh, Betty Ellis from Calvert Memorial Hospital. Uh, Betty, you may start. Okay. 
Next slide, then. How Calvert Memorial got started in this process of Baby Friendly and the Maryland Hospital um, program is back in December of uh, 2011, we were asked to attend the stakeholders meeting by Department of Health and Mental Hygiene um, in the drafting of the Maryland Hospital policy recommendations. So after attending that uh, workshop, I came home and uh, to our hospital and had a meeting with our administration staff and basically gave them um, a synopsis of what the state really was looking at for best practice for our hospitals in Maryland that provide maternity services. So I felt that we needed to be a little bit proactive and immediately kind of get together an interdisciplinary breastfeeding team. So we, um, we went ahead and started that process and we had our first meeting in March of 2012 where we had the chief of OB, chief of pediatrician, uh, pediatrics, our pediatric hospitalists, and then of course um, staff nurses, the lactation consultants, our director. And basically we took our breastfeeding policy and then the draft from Maryland breastfeeding policy and kind of put them side by side and walked through the process on where we needed to make changes. So in the midst of all this, over a few months, the Best Fed Beginnings grant was out and we thought, well, we would apply for that grant to see if that could also help us work towards baby friendly, going towards baby friendly. So that's what we did and unfortunately we did not receive the grant. However, um, because we had applied for that, Baby Friendly was, would accept what we had done for the application for the Best Fed grant and with a commitment letter from our CEO, Mr. Zinnis, um, we decided to go ahead and work on the Baby Friendly process. So next slide. So um, this last year, um, we have been busy in the development phase, which we have just completed, and we are now starting into the training program. So we have uh, decided the core team, which meets weekly, um, consists of our outcomes facilitator, um, two staff nurses that are IBCLC, myself that is the lactation consultant for are approximately a thousand delivery a month hospital and our director. So we meet weekly, as I said, and then we take the information back to our core team, the interdisciplinary team, every other month on what our progress has been. But we decided that um, after review, reviewing all the training options out there to go with lactation education resources. It's an online program. It's called First Latch. And, um, that way, our staff has a six-month period to work on this online. And then they will, all our in staff, will spend four hours with me um, doing, you know, rounds every day. And then they will also have an hour of performing specific skills that we will put together. Um, the family birth centers, techs, and secretaries are going to sit through the two-hour prenatal breastfeeding class and then they will also have an hour of a skill lab competencies. All our physicians from the obstetricians to the pediatricians to the pediatric hospitalists and even the family practice physicians that see newborns will go through the three-hour online first latch program as well. Um, <clears throat> over this last year, the core team has met with all of the different physician groups um, and explained the process that they will be going through. And January 30th will be our kickoff to start the training program throughout the hospital for everyone. So we will be doing a hospital baby-friendly um, fair, and then February 1st we'll start with 
I'm losing my slides. Um, we'll start with um, the competencies and their online training. Next slide. So definitely some of the challenges that we have really come upon has been in the very beginning is I think we became very detail oriented and I don't think you need to be as in depth as we were in the beginning and we found that out when we um, sent in our work plan right from the beginning which helped us. I think that was one of the nicest things is that you have that background with um, the connection with Baby Friendly to kind of guide you. And we also did not really realize the size of this initiative um, because we're all also working, as I'm sure everybody else is, um, in your day-to-day -day, um, clinical practice as well. For myself, I do you know, the classes in the evenings. Um, we also um, see outpatient. So it's a, it's a big undertaking, but well, well worth it. Um, like I said, we were just so excited to get through the development phase and now just rejuvenated as we start to go through the next step. Um, so um, I, I guess that's all I have to say. Okay. Well, thank you, Betty. We, we appreciate your time today. Our next panelist will be Terry Francis from Shady Grove at Venice Hospital. Terry? Good, good morning. Um, I'm the director at Shady Grove. We started our Baby Friendly Initiative um, way back in March of 2011, and it was basically done um, before we really knew much about it. We just knew that we were lacking in breastfeeding support for our patients. So next slide, please. Um, um, I met with the, our VP of nursing. Um, we talked about all the pros and cons. Um, we had been um, in contact with Baby Friendly, so we did know the extent of what was ahead of us, um, but decided to go for it anyway. Um, an agreement was made with um, administration, and we paid, and they paid the fees for Baby Friendly. We set up our committee. Um, it includes myself, the VP of nursing, uh, clinical nurse managers of labor and delivery, the mother-baby unit, NICU, PEDS, um, the education specialists from both perinatal services and children's services. We have five lactation consultants that are all on our committee. Um, there's also a lactation consultant in NICU. Um, we included the um, director of materials management, the director of marketing, and the manager of human resources realizing that this was um, going to be a huge initiative and we needed a lot of hands. Next slide. Um, our training was um, we decided to look at a way that we could really contain the costs. We had um, 300 people to train um, on our units. Um, that included labor and delivery, the mother-baby unit, NICU, and pediatrics. Um, it was a huge expense if we went to an online program, so we wrote our own, um, which is very, very extensive. Um, I don't recommend it, but um, ours is available for anyone who's interested in a copy. Um, and it took a year to get um, everybody through the training, staff-wise. Um, it, it was a self-education packet um, with a quiz at the end of each one. Um, and then we had hands-on training with the lactation consultants. Everybody had to spend five hours, and during that five hours, they did walk around with the lactation consultant, and then they had to um, show their skills that they had learned. The physicians, um, we have asked them to take um, the three-hour course provided by the University of, of Virginia. Um, it was free at the time we took it. I understand now that there is a charge and our administration is paying back any physician who does take the course. Um, new employees um, have to complete the whole 20 hours during their orientation. Next slide, please. Um, some of the challenges. Um, we're a community hospital. Um, we do do 5,000 deliveries a year, but um, getting all your um, obstetricians and pediatricians to take a three-hour course has been um, 
probably our biggest challenge. Um, they really have a choice of which hospitals they go to, and we're not really um, jumping for joy at a, a three-hour training. Um, we probably, at this point right now, have mm, maybe 40% of all the community pediatricians and obstetricians have taken the course. Um, they turn in their certificate to me, and we keep it in a folder. Um, all staff physicians that are hospitalists in labor and delivery, pediatrics, NICU, they have all completed the course. Um, another challenge, of course, is expense. Training that many staff, um, you know, they're not going to do it for free, so you have to pay all your staff for taking all the training, um, and that's 20 hours for 300 people, so that's a huge expense, plus your expense to baby friendly. The work involved is, is huge, um, and we have just um, have not rushed through it. We've taken our time, and like I said, it'll be three years for us um, in March. Um, and, you know, all of us are um, also working at other awards, you know, um, Breastfeeding in the Workplace, the IBCLC Care Award. So there's a lot of other breastfeeding initiatives alone, um, not counting um, what Betty said about we all have our day-to-day -day job to handle also. So um, the time is, is incredible. Next slide. Um, lessons learned. Um, there are some roadblocks. Um, it's not just about the 10 steps. Um, happy to help anybody through that. Um, they can email me or call me. Um, there are roadblocks, um, and that really was unexpected for us. Um, and the requirements um, are difficult when you have a lot of sick babies and a lot of deliveries. Um, and then again, the, um, the dedication from the staff and the time requirements. Um, I think that my, our lesson, um, we're definitely going to go for baby friendly, um, but I think the importance is definitely the 10 steps. We've seen an incredible amount of progress when we began baby friendly. Only 30% of our patients exclusively best breastfed when we um, looked at our stats, um, and now we're probably closer to 75%. So we've come a long way, but in all honesty, um, to achieve baby friendly, we have a lot of challenges still in front of us. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Terry. Our third panelist is Pam Shaw from St. Mary's Hospital. Pam is going in today for Elizabeth Flight who actually work with Pam on the initiative at St. Mary's Hospital. Pam? Hello. I'm happy to be standing in for Liz today, and I hope I can do her justice. She comes from a wealth of knowledge and experience in um, breastfeeding support. She is actually engaged in teaching uh, for the DC Breastfeeding Coalition this morning at Providence Hospital. I am an RN at St. Mary's Hospital. I've been there for 17 years in the OB department, and I'm currently uh, studying to become IBCLC certified with Virgie's LER course, uh, so I was glad to hear that mentioned earlier because it's a fantastic course and I'm learning a lot. I first met uh, Elizabeth Flight in April of 2012 when she came to our hospital. So we've been working closely together over the past year preparing our hospital for the transition to be becoming baby friendly. So we have gone ahead with this process. Uh, she was chosen for her extensive background in setting up lactation programs. She has a lot of military experience uh, she first became an RN in 1985, and Liz became CLC certified in 1991, and in 1993 became IBCLC certified, and most recently in 2012 received her Advanced Nurse Lactation Consultant certification. So she's just a fantastic resource for anybody who needs anything on breastfeeding. Um, it's a delight to be able to work with her. Uh, next slide, please. So our breastfeeding task force came together after our CEO, Christine Ray, signed a commitment letter for our hospital to become baby friendly. So this was a huge step for us. Uh, and we became a multidisciplinary team consisting of many departments within the hospital. 
and I've been asked to kind of share these with you, but uh, Christine Ray is our CEO, Mary Lou Waston, uh, our Vice President of Nursing, Kathleen Whitecotton, of course, our Department Director, has been very supportive. Uh, we have Lori Whirl, our Director of Health Connections, who's also an IBCLC. We uh, brought in outpatient services, Denise McDonald, our Assistant Clinical Director, Melanie Trifone, and of course, Liz Flight is our Chairman of the Breastfeeding Committee. We also have a staff midwife, uh, Emily Gibbons-Baker. We have materials management on board, uh, John Greeley, who's tracking our formula purchase and who code. Um, Nikki Strickland from Marketing, we have Lori Roper from Learning Resources, and then our community partners include the Patuxent Naval uh, Clinic with Captain Sandra Hearn on board, and we also have WIC with Susan Simpson and uh, the Health Department, Anita Stevens, and we also have our local Alechi League with Julie Davis, so this, this team is just huge. And we're realizing to become baby friendly or even get the 10 steps going, it takes a huge community team. Uh, next slide, please. So for our breastfeeding training, Liz created a four-hour core course called Keys to Successful Breastfeeding. And this was a PowerPoint lecture and discussion uh, that she created putting the 10 steps into practice. Liz pretty much gleaned this from an eclectic mix of her own historical pictures and materials, as well as information that she pulled from resources such as BFHI, UNICEF, WHO, WellStart. Uh, and this course includes five hours of hands-on for each associate with a competency requirement, as well as skill sessions that are scheduled with Liz. Uh, all of our employees complete annual competencies with breastfeeding components also. During this implementation, it was over a two-month period, we had 15 sessions that were presented on different days of the week and in different time frames to accommodate the 60-plus staff members we have. A uh, four-hour training is also scheduled every other month to capture our new hires and anyone missing the initial session due to illness or leave. We did receive a grant uh, for CME and CRP training that was developed through the uh, grant funding from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office on Women's Health. And due to this from this grant, we were able to hold our first interdisciplinary breastfeeding support conference. And we held this on August 10th, 2013 at the College of Southern Maryland. Uh, we were able to get two pediatricians as our speakers, Dana Selver and Michael Young, both from Baltimore. Uh, and this, this uh, conference, we were really excited about it. It was well attended, well received. We had uh, 37 attendees. We had OB docs, uh, military representatives there, family nurse practitioner, uh, local LCs, midwives, nurse practitioners, pediatric nurse practitioners. We had a high school counselor there and representatives from um, I believe it's Betty's Calvert Memorial Hospital and also from Southern Maryland Hospital. So we were very excited about that. Um, so next slide, please. Our biggest challenge, uh, again, and I think many of the others have discussed this too, is enticing physician participation. Uh, Liz has commented that this has been an ongoing challenge for her. When she first came to us, she made an effort to meet with all of the doctors and offer her assistance. She put out articles where they could be seen, brought up topics in conversation, and tried to give reports and information directly to the physicians whenever she was working with one of their patients. Uh, a few of the pediatricians requested printed articles, uh, which she emailed to them, 
and she tried to answer questions and query them independently on how they liked to receive their CMEs. Most of them expressed interest in online training and some preferred literature review. Uh, the scheduling of our staff for the core course of course required a lot of cooperation from our assistant director to try and assign the time for uh, all of our nurses and techs to assign to get to the classes and we also had to coordinate with learning resources department to schedule room access and the audio visual equipment. Currently we're working towards developing online training for staff with uh, CITEL. It's a computer-based training module that enables design and development online with uh, complete with training and tracking which really helps. And this is a voiceover slide or video that can be developed. So we're working on that and excited about trying to put that into place. Next slide, please. Lessons learned. <laughs> Liz has shared with me that she wished she had known more about the BFHI process. Liz has extensive knowledge in um, helping hospitals become familiar with and incorporating the 10 steps into successful breastfeeding, but I don't think she was quite prepared for the extent that going baby friendly involves. And a lot of the information in going baby friendly was not really available or discoverable until after payment for the program. Uh, and as I think the others have all discovered, becoming baby friendly hospital is quite labor intensive and it requires a huge amount of dedication and commitment. But again, uh, like Terry was mentioning, we are seeing a huge difference in uh, the success of our moms with breastfeeding just since we've started this process and others are becoming more knowledgeable about it. I as a staff nurse on our unit have seen tremendous improvement by the simple implementation of getting everyone skin to skin as early as possible. So I'm real excited to have Liz on board with us and I know her website and phone number are available to anyone and you can probably obtain that from Sherry if you need it. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for letting me stand in for Liz. Thank you, Pam, and you did a fantastic job representing Thank your you. facility. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, our fourth panelist is Lori Neely from Upper Chesapeake Medical Center. Lori, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, well, I started at Upper Chesapeake Medical Center back in 2000 in developing their lactation program and services. Um, yeah, between 1996 and 2011, I was fortunate enough to work with the Maryland WIC program in developing their state Maryland peer counseling program and training. So I had some background in developing trainings. Um, in the hospital, we were interested in working towards baby friendly. So in 2007, we set up our um, baby friendly committee. Can I have my next slide? So our Baby Friendly Committee consisted of our um, Director of Nursing, our nurse managers from our Nursery Pediatric Department, Department Labor and Delivery, Medical and Med Surge Unit. Um, we had our Children's Services Nurse Educator. We also have a Hospital Educator. All the lactation consultants that are involved at the hospital. Staff nurses from both pediatrics, postpartum, labor, and delivery. We have a past patient on our committee. WIC is involved with us. We have someone from our volunteer services at the hospital and one of our OBGYNs. I also participate in our um, hospital PEDS nurse practice council. So a lot of this um, information goes between the two committees. So on that committee, we have our pediatricians, our hospitalists that are on that, that committee also. Before we applied, we, we applied for Baby Friendly this summer. Um, we had tried back several years ago. That's why we had started our committee in 2007. But we ran into issues with funding. Um, the 
education piece and the purchasing of the formula just was a roadblock that we couldn't pass. So our committee decided we would still work through the 10 steps of Baby Friendly um, on our journey and keep trying to convince the hospital or come up with funds to cover the cost um, of moving forward. So this summer we had um, already, we felt we had already accomplished eight of the 10 steps and went ahead and applied to Baby Friendly um, after we got the support of our nursing administration. Getting our letter from our CEO was easy. He uh, was really on board with this. Can I have my next slide? So once we um, applied this summer and moved into the 4D pathway, um, some of the issues that we did not realize was that there was a lot of secondary steps when you're looking at baby friendly. So for instance, we had a hospital breastfeeding policy that follows the guidelines with baby friendly, but we did not realize until we were into the process that they required a summary of it um, and to have it prominently displayed in all areas that service mothers, infant, and children. So there's a lot of little subset steps in the 10 steps to baby friendly that we're slowly working through. What we had developed throughout um, the past several years at working towards baby friendly, we started out doing our own trainings. Um, staff members all came with us um, in lactation for eight hours. Um, they did hands-on training. We do unit competencies every year. And for instance, this year I laid in a bed for three days while the nurses um, positioned me um, showed me how to breastfeed a baby. We had um, posters on skin to skin. So every year lactation for years now has participated in unit competencies. How we were doing our trainings where we were bringing in speakers so we would have a conference once or twice a year. Um, we had a really nice one last year with Frank Nice and we were able to get our radiology physicians, um, emergency room physicians, pharmacy, OBGYN, pediatricians to attend. Um, but we decided after jumping into Baby Friendly that our training seemed to be a little bit too disjointed. and We really thought we should just do a straight 15-hour training. We at our hospital do have um, a computer system where we are going to be putting the study modules on the, the hospital intranet and the staff can go on. They'll be voiced over. And that way it will streamline it that we'll be able to keep track of who's done it and who hasn't done it for Baby Friendly. Um, another thing that we did um, for training staff is two years ago we decided to turn the core measures that was being recommended to monitor exclusive breastfeeding rates into a performance improvement indicator. So in 2011 we started measuring our exclusive breastfeeding rates, but we challenged the staff to increase our exclusive breastfeeding rates by 25%. Our performance improvement indicators are tied into our staff evaluation. So we have to meet it at least by 50% of the time in order for the staff to get the points on their evaluation, which is tied into staff raises. So it, very quickly we were able to, within just a couple months, to get our exclusive breastfeeding rates up to 20, uh, increase by 25% and a lot of times up over that. Um, another way we educate our staff is we develop the Tata -ta Tweets. And so we have our door on our lactation office that we keep monthly postings of new stuff in the literature, research base. Um, the docs love that I have all of the drugs that are safe to use in the radiology department. If they have somebody going down for MRIs or CAT scans, they can quickly just go to the door for a reference. So we decided to do our 15-hour training, and that's the process that I'm in right now. I contacted um, Amy. Uh, Resnick with the um, Marilyn Wick program and asked if she would like to help me develop these trainings so that we could get them posted. Um, we also decided to work together and it, my frustration with Baby Friendly is not having these tools, not having the, the trainings available and I would like to develop something that then we could gear towards the Maryland hospital breastfeeding policy also and have it available not just to Upper Chesapeake but available to everybody. So we're currently working on that. Um, our physician training, we're using the lactation management study module that um, 
is available online, and our physicians are going to actually this next month start taking that. Um, all our employees will have to be doing annual competencies, but we've been doing that already, so I don't think that's going to be too big of a challenge. Can I have my next slide? So some of the challenges, um, definitely it was the cost of the trainings and the cost of the formula. Um, we now have the commitment from our administration to cover those costs, but part of convincing them to, to jump on board with this is that we um, had already banned our bags during the process. We did that over two years ago, and we found the funding for that um, through a, a kickback that you get from your photo companies that come in. So we used um, the 365 photo company, and with the money that the hospital gets from that, we asked to receive that money back. Um, we involved the staff with banning the bags, and that was part of the other buy-in that we really got. Um, we allowed the staff to create the logo that was on the bag, so that's the logo you see there on the screen. They all voted on it and then picked the color of the bag. At first, we had some resistance with getting rid of the bag, but once we let the staff decide on what the bag was going to be like, they really um, bought into it, and it was an easy process. Um, so like I said, part of our challenge is just the lack of the tools, um, and that is with the trainings. Can I have my next slide? So sharing of information, that's why I reached out to WIC so that we could try and develop, and we are developing, um, 15 uh, trainings that are going to mirror the Maryland Hospital breastfeeding policies along with Baby Friendly. Um, we plan to have them completed by January, and then we'll start the process of voiceovering them so that they can be available on um, the Maryland website as well. Um, we do a lot of sharing, and like the other um, um, speakers have said, you know, you have your own job to work on, and this is a huge commitment to jump into. Some of the other projects I work on is providing breast pumps to women with AIDS in Africa. Um, so finding the time to do this is just really a huge, huge commitment. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Sherry. Okay. Thank you, Lori. Appreciate all of your insight and all of your hard work. Okay, um, the training resources list. The Maryland Hospital Breasting Policy Recommendations Committee developed a, a resources list as a companion piece to this webinar. The training list is for informational purposes only, and DHMH does not endorse any of these resources, and the list uh, is not inclusive of all training resources that are available. The training resources list consists of online trainings continuing education, and additional resources. For some of the trainings, no fee is charged, while for others, a fee is charged. You will need to refer to the resources list to contact the specific organizations and they're looking at their fee structures. This resources list will be emailed to all participants of this webinar, and the list will also be posted on the DHMH website on the Maryland Breastfeeding Policy recommendations page. Again, as a reminder, the question chat box is the only way to ask questions. We will try to address as many questions as possible, time permitting. Amy Resnick will be facilitating the question and answer section of this webinar. So Amy, when you're ready, you can ask the panel the questions. Good morning, everybody. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. We have room for more questions, so I encourage all of you to, who have questions to continue to ask them, send them in. Um, no question is a bad question. That's how we all learn. And if you're thinking of something, I'm sure there's somebody else who's th thinking the same thing. So please um, give us your questions so we can get them answered. The first question I am going to direct towards uh, Terry uh, at Shady Grove, uh, because it seems like that was where it was directed. And if anybody else wants to um, jump on and, and answer after her, that would be great. Uh, the question being, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on, um, let, me, let me find the question. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the roadblocks uh, that you've encountered from Baby Friendly USA. Uh, and in addition to the, 
those specific roadblocks, do you anticipate finding the same roadblock through the Maryland uh, best practice policies, or would that alleviate that? Um, a couple things surprised us. Um, we have gotten as far as our um, phone call with Baby Friendly before they, they check your status and they look at everything you're doing and they, um, you're on the phone with them for about an hour and they kind of survey and, and assess whether you're ready for them to come out and actually um, survey your hospital um, as being baby friendly or not. Um, some of the things that surprised us um, were things like um, any baby that is supplemented, whether they're supplemented for um, uh, medical indication like um, a blood sugar issue or hyperbilirubinemia, 80% um, of those um, babies cannot um, be supplemented with um, a bottle and a nipple. Um, they, so that was something that we hadn't heard before. Um, we, you know, we absolutely um, have done everything um, or we are challenged and working very hard to um, keep our supplementation only to medical indications. But we were surprised that 80% of those babies that are supplemented, whether it's for a medical indication or not, um, must um, be a syringe or cup feeding or finger feeding um, or something like that. I think that that was probably our biggest surprise. Um, I think one of the panelists already mentioned that it's not just the 10 steps. There's a lot of, um, when you get your baby friendly information, once you have signed up, that's also a challenge because you don't know it ahead of time. There's a lot of steps under each step. So I think that that's, it's those secondary steps that were challenged. Um, and do I think that, um, I think that part of the question was, do I think that that's going to be part of the Maryland initiative? I don't see it. Um, I think the important thing for all hospitals is not whether you go baby friendly or not, but to follow the 10 steps. And we have seen amazing improvement from um, our patients. Patients that have come back to us with their second baby or their third baby have said they um, are shocked with the difference of the support for breastfeeding at the hospital. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to give a minute to see if either Betty, Pam, or Lori want to chime in. I know you guys are all also in the road to baby friendly, so do you have other roadblocks to add to that list? Uh, this is Pam. I, I see the same kind of roadblocks just being a staff nurse on the floor and finding ways, creative ways, to supplement babies with formula or to discourage nurses already on the floor that we're, we're trying to get everyone on board with the 10 steps and the supplementation issue because we're all so used to being able to throw a bottle in there whenever we individually feel that it's needed. So uh, that's been one of the obstacles I've seen as just trying to get baby friendly on board within our own staff uh, and maintaining that. So more education is going to be needed and getting across to the staff the different methods, the cup feeding, the finger feeding, the tube feeding, for uh, actually supplementing those infants that do need some formula supplementation. Absolutely. Thank you. This is Laurie. Um, yeah, I agree. We, we, like I said, we had started working on this back in 2007. and. Um, so we have a little bit more of an advantage of that. We started way back then looking at supplementation. So we're, we do a lot of finger feeding and cup feeding. I would have to say none of our babies that get supplemented um, actually get it with a bottle that are choosing to breastfeed. But like I had said earlier, those sub-steps within each step is what's been daunting for us in the task of moving forward. And I don't see um, that the Maryland hospital policy as as having so many roadblocks as you do when you're trying to go toward baby friendly and that if hospitals just really look at the Maryland um, Maryland hospital breastfeeding policy it, it it will be a little bit easier to achieve some of these steps great this is Betty from Calvert I think for us um, 
since we are a smaller community hospital, like I said, we have under the thousand deliveries a year. Um, we truly have not been using the bottle nipples for supplementation in years. We do do finger feeding or cup feeding. And I would say in our last year and a half on this journey, we've been doing more of the supplementing at the breast with a feeding tube and syringe. So, and um, very rarely do I ever have anyone uh, ha using a bottle at all. So I think because we have been smaller and we've, and we've been doing competencies here probably for a, the last 10 years at least, um, we usually do three competencies with our nurses every year anyway. And one of the, always one of the uh, competencies is for supplementation. So I think for us, that part has been easier. Our challenge has been more, we've never done data collecting. So kind of changing the whole structure in our charting on, you know, with the computer to be able to pull out all this data, that's been really challenging and working with the IT department. Um, so that's been, I think, for us, the biggest block. Thank you. Uh, this, is, this is Terry. Can I add one more thing? Sure. Um, another um, surprise um, that we did here on our phone survey was um, if you have a mom that has decided to formula feed, um, you not only have to tell her the benefits of breastfeeding, but you're required to tell her the risks of formula. Um, and they are very definite about that. And my staff found that very, very difficult. Um, we are still challenged with that because to walk into a mom who's come to the hospital um, and this might be her second or third baby, has definitely formula fed, but you are required to um, let her know the risks of formula. Stuff like allergies and obesity and those kinds of things. And you find that patients um, are not very positive um, when someone walks into their room and uh, challenges them. So we have really, um, are working really, really hard with the staff on a way to communicate that to a patient um, in a very kind, loving, nice way. And Terry, this is Pam. I would like to add to that it, that, that it seems like we should really try and focus on hitting these folks prenatally before they even get to the hospital so that some of these, this information and uh, decisions are placed out there ahead of time so that they're at least exposed to it before they get to the hospital and we have to present these kind of ideas to them. Absolutely. So, so prenatally I see a lot of, uh, where we could place a lot of focus is prenatally and trying to get, capture these women um, before they even get to us to get a lot of that information started and going and just get the thought processes going in their minds. It would help a lot by the time they get to the floor. Thank you, Terry. This is Betty again. Um, one of the things that we are in the process of doing, um, working with our um, IT department and our wellness department, is on the hospital website. We're really going to be putting out what the 10 steps really mean and explaining skin to skin and the supplementation and breast milk being the optimal way of feeding. So we're going to, that's what we're hoping to, to help with prenatally, um, one of the aspects of it, you know, besides going into all the OB doctor's offices and doing training with their staff and the pediatric office as well. Like you said, I believe too, it definitely has to start prenatally. Oh, that's a great idea. This is Amy. I'm going to cut in and go to some more questions because we have them flowing in. Um, this one, I believe, is going to be a quick one. Uh, and I think it is directed toward Terry, although probably any of you guys can answer it because you're all going baby friendly. Are the NICUs being certified at the same time as the mother-baby units? Uh, this is Terry. At this time, um, our NICU is looking into it um, and hope to begin next year. but they're not necessarily being certified at the same time. No, no. Correct, when baby, I don't when, believe that's part of baby friendly. No, it is not. NICU is definitely not, but I do understand there is a baby friendly certification coming for NICUs. Right. Great. Thank you. 
wanted to clarify that for everybody. Okay, coming back to another question. I thought that only hospital physicians need to do the training for baby friendly. I applaud Shady Grove's push to educate the community docs, but is it needed for certification? No. No. Um, I contacted Baby Friendly um, about this because it's a huge, huge challenge getting community pediatricians. I mean, I think we have 150 pediatricians that come to us, um, and many are just flat out refusing to take the education. Um, I think the, the rule basically is to continually um, encourage physicians, which we do at every department meeting, but it's basically all physicians that, um, like hospitalists, that work for the hospital. Great. Anybody else trying to reach out to their community physicians and finding? Okay. I'm going to go on to another question. There seems to be a lot of redundancy among the programs. Upper Chesapeake is making a new online program, uh, yet Shady Grove already has one, as does St. Mary's. Um, I don't have any more to that. It's just kind of a statement. Does anybody want to comment toward that? Uh, this is Terry again. I, what I can tell you is when we began in 2011 and contacted Baby Friendly, um, they, they had nothing for us. Um, and uh, financially, um, to keep our costs down, um, we really felt like we had no choice. Um, I, I think there is redundancy. Um, but I, I think it's a wonderful thing that um, a program will be developed for Maryland hospitals and anyone who wants to use it will be able to go online and, and use it. I think it's great because you do feel like you're constantly reinventing the wheel. Again, this is Betty from Calvert. I think for us, since we are a very small hospital, um, we have 50 RNs to go through the training. So for us going through an online program, like I said, and we're using First Latch, um, and we had budgeted for that. So, um, and the staff, we had to budget for their training as well. And definitely it is an expense, but we really have a great support system with our CEO and our director of nursing as well. So um, they're even, you know, putting up the funding to do the physicians as well. So we did have that support that way as far as the financing goes. Anybody else? Okay. Um, you discussed the, I think this one is going toward Lori. Uh, you discussed the creation of new take-home bag for patients when they leave the hospital. What types of things were put in these new bags? Um, well, we use um, Cotton Cottonwood Kids Company, and so we they give you a little cooler bag that goes in it that has some breast pads, and it's certified baby friendly. Um, so if you go with them to develop your bag, you get this little cooler bag for free. But then we put our patient education in there. So we have a folder that has all our breastfeeding information, and then anything else for the hospital um, that the patient may need to know. So that's it. We don't allow anything else to go into the bag. The bags, I control them actually and um, work with the volunteer services or my techs on the unit to just when they come in to stuff them um, with just our patient folder information. And that's it. I, I, we don't market anything else in that bag to the patients. Okay. Anybody I'll, else want to add? I'll add to that, uh, Lori, uh, this is Pam from St. Mary's. We ran into the same thing when we were banning our bag and trying to get any marketing information off our shelves uh, or any handouts that we were giving. And then we found out that a lot of our handouts were Medela and breastfeeding information. So we're kind of in a crunch there because Medela had some really nice handouts. But because of the baby-friendly issue and marketing, uh, we're challenged on creating some new forms and handouts for our patients that don't have any kind of marketing logo on them. So we do feel like we're recreating some wheels. <laughs> right. We, um, this is Laurie again. We had the same issue back when we started, and we were using the Medela handout. But our um, patient education committee was um, looking at a new 
uh, education binder to give to the patients that's developed and there's online links in it um, uh, and so yeah. we had looked at it and they allowed me to, to go through it and lo and behold the company had a baby friendly um, piece to it so that's our patient education is in there and it's a nice uh, little booklet that they can go online and watch videos on but it goes over all of their care the mom the baby and breastfeeding oh nice thank you we have time for one more question. Amy, do you have one more for the panel? Sure. Yeah, there's a few more, but the last one we'll use, um, we'll we'll hold here, and then we can answer some the others and get the answers out to you, and we'll communicate that back. So don't feel like your question won't be answered. How do your hospitals manage outpatient supports and consults for breastfeeding dyads? Do you bill for these visits? Do you squeeze them in? Or just set us, or do you set aside uh, time and space with lactation consultants for this? Um, this is Laurie. I can start off. Um, we have a twice a week run support group at Upper Chesapeake that meets every Tuesday and Thursday. We started that back in 2000, and so we'll have moms can come in and meet with our lactation consultants. We get about 20 to 30, so we're servicing our whole community, so not just our patients from our hospital, but we get a lot from the Baltimore area that come to see us. We were seeing patients on an outpatient you know, where they could come in after and see the lactation consultant. We don't do that much because we have the support group and we are so busy on the floor to squeeze somebody in is, is just really difficult. So we primarily use our support group and it's an hour to an hour and a half every Tuesday and Thursday. Unfortunately, we have to work that into our day on the floor. So our lactation consultants come in, they have their patients but that twice a week they have to leave the floor to go do their support group. We also um, collaborate with the Maryland WIC program, and so they have a peer counselor that will come over and do our weight checks for us because we'll weigh our babies and then have the moms feed so that we can do pre- and post-weights on each baby and make sure that everything's going okay. St. Mary's, this is Pam, St. Mary's Hospital has a similar program through their Health Connections where lactation's consultants are available for a mom support group once a week on Wednesdays for two hours. And this has been hugely attended and is very popular with the moms also. And this is Betty at Calvert. Um, we also have been doing the breastfeeding support groups probably 15 years. So it is for um, two hours on a Wednesday morning. And we also do outpatient consults uh, for a fee. But if a mom just is coming in, you know, they can definitely the support group is, is just huge. Um, we have an average of 15 to 20 every Wednesday, and we probably, you know, do a couple consults a week. Um, but we do allow also for free is doing just weight checks if anybody wants to come in. Um, all they do, it need to do is just call me, and we can set up a time so they can come in that day at any time. Anybody else? Great. Well, there are a few more questions that we haven't answered, although the ones that we haven't answered aren't specifically related to education of staff. And we will address those questions, um, get our speakers to help us address those questions and get the information out to you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Next steps. Um, the Maryland Hospital Breasting Policy Recommendation Committee members are seeking hospital input on our committee. We need you, so please consider applying to be on this ARC committee. Um, if you're interested in applying um, to be a member of the committee, please indicate on the survey that will be um, completed after this webinar is, is finished. The next step for our committee is to evaluate the need for further webinars or meetings based on the surveys submitted today, as well as the surveys that we received in July. Okay, directions for the survey for this webinar. Immediately following the ending of the webinar, a pop-up will surface that says the webinar is ended. Be sure to click close. If you do not click close, you will not be redirected to the survey. Complete the survey and hit the submit button. Again, please consider applying to be a member of the Maryland Hospital Breastfeeding Policy Recommendations Committee. 
contact information for our panelists is listed on this slide. Again, just a few reminders. Uh, this webinar was recorded. It will, there will be a link to this webinar sent to you, as well as the training resources list. Both the resources list and the webinar recording will be posted on the Maryland Breastfeeding Policy Recommendations page within the next few days. Thank you for joining the webinar and enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to go back to the panelists' uh, emails just in case you want to jot those down. And we really do appreciate all of your support for all of our moms and babies and their resting endeavors in Maryland. Thank you very much.